The theme of the, the uh, convention is the 90th year. And I was trying to sit back and how can I play the role, but I always, I'm, I'm kind of the bottom line guy, and so I always wanted to say to you, sometimes when we offer you a certain thing, uh, we have to, to go out and, and put together a program that really means something to this organization. So what I did, let me, I got four major components I want to talk about today. And I'm not going to use my notes. I'm just going to give you what, in my heart, what I think we need to do. One of them was because of what happened with the uh, Macondo situation with BP, our industry changed. And a lot of things happened. And we were shut down. And so what happened was I was sitting with the staff one day which is a great staff. And I said, there's a wealth of knowledge that needs to be obtained from this incident. What happened? Where are we going? What are we going to do in the future? Because, you know, if we don't learn from our mistakes, we'll never move forward. And I think that we needed to learn from that mistake, and we need to put the best effort forward. There's four components that really jumped out at me when <clears throat> after the incident that occurred. One was the companies that are in this room today realized immediately that they had to get back to work. But the only way they were going to get back to work was to put a response team together. So they reached in their pockets and raised billion, billion and a half dollars. This grows every day. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an ongoing situation. But they put together the MWCC and the Helix companies. And those companies have to be there. If you heard Admiral Watson today, he talked about as part of the permit process. So if they're not there, we're not going anywhere. And so because of their ingenuity and their willingness to, to get back and, and form as a complete company, everybody jumped in together. It's not one company that needs to say, I did it. They all did it. And because of that, we now are prepared in case something occurs, we can go out and we can respond and we can, we can take care of our business and make sure that we're ready. So our companies have put up when they needed to put up and they're prepared and I think we now can go to the uh, Admiral and say, Admiral, this won't be a stop for us going forward in the Gulf. This is not gonna hold us back. Secondly, a couple of things happened. We realized that we couldn't speak in Washington as an industry. As much as we wanted to go to Washington, said it's not our fault. We didn't make it happen. We didn't want it to do. They weren't going to listen to us. But we were very fortunate that we had someone in office at that time. And you heard his praises today. And I surely can't give the jokes that Angel can give. But Scott was there. And Scott was the Secretary of Natural Resources at the time. And he was a voice for our government. We were very fortunate that we had somebody that who could get into the thick of things and try to work it out. And so, Scott, I want to take this moment and I want to personally say on behalf of everybody in the room how much we appreciate what you did. <laughs> but I, a couple other things I don't want to fail to mention. And, and those are, because of Scott's leadership, and, and, and he's no longer at DNR, but while he was at DNR, he not only helped us get back in rapid time back to the Gulf, I want to thank him for his leadership in the ultra-deep unitization bill that was passed last year. That's going to give us a lot of work in the future, folks. It made it possible for those uh, $150 million AFEs to be spent and to give us an opportunity to hold on some land. And it was his leadership that helped us get that unitization bill passed. And I might say he did it in a pretty good way. We didn't lose one vote. So it's not, it's not a, it's, it's remarkable when you think about what the bill says and where we are and what we did. Besides that, he also helped us with the legacy bill. Now legacy, I promise you, you would never understand it, but even amongst ourselves, it was, it was a tough issue. It, and, but we managed to struggle through it all and go forward. And one thing that Angel always did, he kept it alive. 
The ball kept bouncing back and forth and he kept it alive. And if it had not been for them, it's a good chance that it would have died. But because of his efforts, he kept it alive and we ended up able to cross the goal line. So that's, that's very important. So I want to thank you, Scott, for all your hard work. And we look forward to you working with us in the future and being a big part of our association. And, and uh, thank you for everything you've done. But at the But one thing that we know that we need to do as an association with that number two is that we must always maintain someone in state government who we can have as a voice to talk to the regulators in Washington and do it. And that's not an easy task, folks. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to be involved when they get these appointments made and know exactly who's, who's going to be there so that we can have that voice in Washington. And uh, so that was the second thing that we learned from the situation. And the third thing that we learned is a, a component that kind of amazed me when I really sat back and looked at it. It's the educational uh, component. Think of this. We don't have a school of excellence in Louisiana. After 40 something years or 50 years of drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, whoever you talk to, we do not have a school of excellence to train our workforce. And I think it's time that we step back. We know how important it's going to be in the future to have the right people that are trained and ready to go. And so we need to form this school of excellence. The automobile industry has one in Michigan for the auto workers, and the, uh, Florida has one for tourism. And, and Louisiana needs to take pride and form this school and get ready to go and train the people. Now, we at Lamoga have met with uh, the president of Louisiana Community Technical College System, Joe May, and, and we sat down and we've talked to him and we've gone to the Fletcher School and looked and I've toured it, I've walked it, I've felt it and I've touched it and they're getting ready to build the first building. And I also want to commend one of our members. I realize they had a rough year. They spent $30 billion paying back what, they, what the mistake that they made. But at the same time, they have come up with $4 million to start this first school of excellence. And the state has matched that with $4 million. So we're going to have the first building is under construction at Fletcher. And at the same time, we've taken out of that $8 million, we've taken $1 million, and we bought equipment to make sure that we have the, the technology and the equipment that's going to need to be studied and, and, and learned on at the, at the school now. So that's when we kind of came into it. BP is, came to me and asked me if I would look into it. I looked into it, and, and I think that it's something that we really need to do. So I asked them, the first question is, how are we going to get the curriculums? How are we going to know what we have to do? Well, I'm proud to say that we have, from all the majors in this room that are operating in the Gulf, just about, or have a representative who has helped write that curriculum, who is putting it together. But what we're going to do better than that, we're going to take a second look at it and make sure it's exactly what we need, and it's going to be taught by the people that understand that equipment and move forward on it. Then, I guess, after, after we moved through all of that size of it, we said, well, what, what's the next step? Well, the next step is that we go ahead and we have the two-year college. And we have a responsibility to make sure that this thing works. So I've reached out to the administration. And I've asked the administration, I said, you know, I don't think it's our responsibility to be the one building all the buildings. And I said, I think the administration should build the buildings, and we should have a responsibility for several items. And this is what I said. We need the curriculum. We need the equipment. We need scholarships. And we need endowments. And so that we make sure that that school stays full with the right people so that it goes forward and it doesn't fall on its, on its face. Now, speaking to the admiral last night, he's looking for a place to put a school. So it's our job as an industry 
We don't want to control the school, but we wouldn't mind having them studying and making sure we all study in the same equipment so when they go out to inspect, that they expect the equipment that we're ready for and that we can go ahead and, and, and that we're all on the same page and that we're not on different pages. So we're going to try to put this committee together to go forward and, and to deal with them. And the ultimate goal is that every person working in the Gulf of Mexico deep water have a two-year degree. That's our goal. We're going to take some time. You know, when I, I asked some of the people and some of the larger companies, I said, well, you know, we've got people with 30 years experience that are working out there. And they said, well, that's good and fine, but technology has passed them by. And it's hard to sit down and believe, but it's true. I mean, you know, I mean, they don't read the computers. They don't do all of the things that, that are happening. So it's our, it's our job to get those people either grandfathered in or, or, or get them trained and get this new generation coming up to, to be able to go out and service us. And fourthly, this is one that uh, really kind of got to me. Uh, it's dealing with the emergency itself and dealing with claims that are happened during the time of, a, uh, of this type of emergency. You would not believe exactly how the money was spent and what should have been done during this type of emergency. Think of it this way. We have a couple of opportunities during an incident. You can have a political solution in which some people do and they ran out and they just tried to start solving the problem. Okay, and they tried to put the fire out. Or you can have a legal decision in which you go to the courts and let the courts kind of lay the game work sort of like a uh, bankruptcy, I guess. They, they set all the standards, they say everything, and, 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 and give you a roadmap. It's probably a combination of the two. But what we don't have is to know how to handle it and not waste money. Can you imagine spending $30 billion and still climbing? I just, it's just not right, I just want to tell you. And it's not right for the money that was wasted on some of the, the, the claims that were put out. So what we did, we've had the first meeting. We met with the adjudicator from the uh, state courts and asked him to say, explain to us where we need to go. Tell us how we can put a matrix together, how we can have a game plan and a game book in which we can give to our company so they can pre-plan and be ready to go and not have to be worried about what's going to happen in the, in the future and how to get slaughtered. So they have agreed once all the claims areas have shut down, and that's about 90 days, I think, within 90 days. It's probably not even 90 days now. But once it cuts cut off, that they can come back and sit down to us and start helping us build a roadmap. And that's going to be one of the things that we do in the association is build this roadmap and get the matrix so that we can be able to have something to give to our companies. So in case an incident happens, we know exactly what to do. We're going to be able to respond. We're going to be able to talk. We're going to be able to hope we got the best educated, and we're going to hope that we have the roadmap. So that's pretty much where we headed. That's a lot, a lot on the table for this year when you think of the tax session that we have in the next 60 days. But uh, we're, we're going to handle those taxes, and we're going to, and we're going to be able to move forward. But we want to show value from Lamoga to our clients, to our people. And I think this is something that we can do to show value. And we appreciate it very, very much. And I just wanted to. Uh, let you know what your association was doing, what the staff was doing, what everybody was doing to make the deep water uh, top priority because if you listen today, the rigs are now, there was 51 rigs and climbing, so uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get nothing but bigger, but we're going to need people to run it. And if we don't have the people, we're in, we're in trouble. So thank you very much on my little part. There's a movement of vocal and well-funded activists that are engaged in an un unabated war on fossil fuels. Now this war on fossil fuels is a war between talkers and doers. One side is a group 
that is convinced that, uh, that renewable fuels with enough government subsidies and with enough fervent prayer, and as Clay very diplomatically stated it, on the biofuels and alternatives, they're gonna be a very small portion of our energy future in the next 30, 40, 50 years. I'm not so kind. I maintain that we, I maintain that we cannot grow, blow, or glow our way to, secure, to a secure energy future. They, 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 there, are, there are talkers, and then unfortunately, there are also some takers. The message today for, for the folks from Louisiana, for the folks from around the country is, we are on the verge of a manufacturing renaissance. We are on the verge of energy, North American energy independence, and we can, we can bring back a strong economy, jobs, energy security, and national security. All we have to do is take advantage of the resources that we have right here under our feet and off our shores. We can, we can make the country again an economic uh, dominant force throughout the world, and we can, we can have our, as I said, our North American energy independence. But we, we need to have the right policies coming out of Washington to do so. And unfortunately, heretofore, we've had more roadblocks than we've had uh, opportunities. We need to address those roadblocks. We need to get rid of those obstacles and move forward and get this country started on a, on a path to economic development. What would you like to see Congress and the administration do in this area? Let the free market work. We need, we need to have a free market. Now, there's no, no question there, you know, the regulation is part of a free market. There has to be safeguards, but we don't need those, the, the unnecessary, burdensome, and costly obstacles. We don't need a, a government that tries to create winners and losers in the marketplace. We need to make sure that we understand that we have the God-given resources we have to uh, develop them soundly, safely, environmental, and with environmental consciousness, and move on, again, to become an economic dominant force in the world. Our regulatory priorities going forward is a SEMS II role, uh, which is uh, really fairly less impactful, I think, uh, in, in a detailed way than SEMS I, but I think is, is very important when you think about our desire to have a consistent safety culture um, in the offshore industry. And what I mean by that is I think that uh, the folks that come to work when they, when they enter their first job offshore till the day that they retire, they would want to know, um, first of all, what they should expect from all their other uh, uh, fellow workers offshore and what they should expect from the company um, that's supporting them out there in terms of, of the safety uh, standards and practices. My message here today is uh, have good cooperation between the uh, U.S. government and the, specifically the, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement uh, on, on safety and environmental protection in the Outer Continental Shelf while uh, we produce oil and gas uh, for the needs of our country. Talk a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, permit activity in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, you know, it's picked up. Uh, we've had an ever-increasing uh, number of applications for uh, drilling permits, for production permits. Uh, there's been an increase in the number of uh, drilling rigs coming into the Gulf, uh, about 10 more this year than last year. So a lot of activity for the Bureau uh, of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which issues those permits. When we started having our annual meeting uh, about four years ago, we thought that the annual meeting was just the absolute perfect time and the right occasion to recognize special contributions and achievements from our member companies uh, and individuals in those companies. You know, we created the Pelican Award back in 2010, and this award recognizes the outstanding achievement and commitment to the oil and gas industry, the community, the environment, the state of Louisiana. It is the highest honor that we give at Louisiana Mid-Continent Oil and Gas Association. You know, in 2010, we honored Marathon uh, for, uh, in recognition for their expansion of the Garyville project, which at the time was one of the largest capital expenditure, uh, expenditure projects in the history of the state of Louisiana. In 2011, we honored Exxon for 100 years of their presence here in Louisiana. And then last year, we honored Shell Oil. Uh, Shell was 
was uh, the recipient of the award in their recognition of their company's vast assets here in Louisiana and also in the Gulf of Mexico. Now this year I'm very, very proud and very pleased to announce that Chevron Corporation is the recipient of the 2013 Pelican Award in recognition of its accomplishments, its contributions, its investments in Louisiana, and its leadership in offshore development in the Gulf of Mexico. As many of you know, Chevron is one of the largest integrated companies uh, in the world. It's one of the largest producers and leaseholders in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Chevron is a proven leader in providing safe and clean oil and gas in this region for more than 60 years with experience of over 60 years in the Gulf of Mexico. Now every day Chevron has about 3,000 employees that work very dedicated and diligently to find newer, smarter ways to power America. Whether it's exploration, production, pipeline operations, or marketing, um, Chevron has been there. They have a long history of consistent support to Midcontinent Oil and Gas. After doing a little research, uh, we found out that there have been four past chairmans that represented Chevron in, on, on, as the board of directors, chairman of the board of directors of Midcontinent Oil and Gas over its 90-year history, uh, more, than, more than any other company that we, we could find records back. Uh, Chevron's vision to the energy, uh, to energy uh, is most admired for its people, its partnerships, its performance, and certainly recognized as being a good neighbor in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Chevron shows its commitment to Louisiana through several very, very highly visible projects, uh, one of which was the volunteer program for the Super Bowl here in New Orleans a couple of three weeks ago, uh, the de development of a multi-million dollar social initiative such as Chevron's Energy for Learning Education Program and Chevron Gulf Coast Revitalization Program that address the ongoing relief and recovery in response to the hurricanes and the Deepwater Horizon. It is a real honor uh, for me to present the 2013 uh, Pelican Award to the Chevron Corporation, and it is a very higher honor uh, for me to ask uh, Mr. Gary Luquette to come join me on stage. Uh, Gary is a Louisiana native, grew up in Abbeville, uh, and he has um, actually had uh, uh, the opportunity to be the guest speaker, the featured speaker at the Mid-Continent uh, annual meeting a couple of three years ago. So, uh, Gary, come on up and... Uh, and, and the Gulf of Mexico is really important to Chevron, so if you had any questions as to whether we were going to be around for a while, let me put that to rest. Uh, about a third of our budget over the next three years is going to be invested, our North American budget is going to be invested in the Gulf of Mexico. So this has been and will continue to be a very important place for us. We're going to put a lot of money and a lot of love and attention into our assets in the Gulf of Mexico and onshore uh, Louisiana. So we've got uh, two big projects that we plan to install in 2014. Bigfoot project, which is a Mycene development, and our first operated uh, lower tertiary trend project, the Jack St. Mallow project and we're hopeful that that provides a template for subsequent uh, deep water developments. We also have an exciting play in ultra deep gas which uh, the well that we're drilling now is in Cameron Parish onshore but uh, you know if we can make that work uh, we see a lot of opportunities to follow up on that so yet another exciting part of our investment portfolio. So we're going to be around for a while we look forward to partnering with many of you in the days, months, and years to come. And thanks again, Chris. And congratulations, by the way. I understand Lamoga will be celebrating its 90-year anniversary here sometime this year. And Chevron's been a, a partner in Lamoga now for over 40 years. So we're proud to be a partner with you. Thank you.